Welcome to the Animal Law Symposium. When the COVID-19 pandemic started, there was a lot of speculation about its origin. But as time has passed, the focus has redirected to recovery. But it's important that we learn from this life-altering event. This year's Animal Law Symposium focuses on the pressing issue of evaluating and adapting our relationships with animals to prevent the next pandemic, as well as to protect the billions of animals currently exploited and killed by human beings. This two-day online event features panels focused on the root causes of COVID-19 and other zoonotic diseases, including factory farming, incursions into wildlife habitat, and our treatment of animals in captivity. And we'll offer policy recommendations aimed at preventing future pandemics. Over the past 14 months, the Animal Legal Defense Fund staff and experts from across the country have worked together to develop a series of papers with policy strategies to reduce and eliminate zoonotic disease risks. Today, we'll start by identifying the root causes of zoonotic diseases like COVID-19, which result from the ways we interact with and exploit other animals. Kicking us off today are Dr. Aisha Akhtar, CEO and President of the Center for Contemporary Sciences, and Animal Legal Defense Fund Senior Legislative Affairs Manager, Stephanie Harris, speaking about the sources of zoonotic disease and how our troubled relationship with animals increases the risks for zoonotic pandemic disease outbreaks. Enjoy. As mentioned, this session features a pre-recorded discussion between Dr. Aisha Akhtar and myself. Dr. Akhtar is a double board certified neurologist and preventive medicine specialist with a background in public health. She's the president and CEO of the Center for Contemporary Sciences, which is pioneering the transition to replace the use of animals in experimentation with effective human-based technologies. Dr. Akhtar is also the author of the recent book, Our Symphony with Animals, on health, empathy, and our shared destinies. Combining medicine, social sciences, and stories, her book explores how deeply the well-being of humans and animals are entwined. She's also the author of Animals and Public Health, which argues for the need for medical institutions to include animals as part of the public in public health. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Akhtar. Dr. Akhtar, we know our exploitation of animals puts us at an increased risk for the next global pandemic. Can you tell us how those relationships have changed over time and, and how that has influenced our level of risk? Sure, so our level of risk has significantly increased over the past few decades. As a matter of fact, we've seen an increasing rise in the number of new infectious diseases, especially viruses. And it does get back to ultimately, in large part, to how we treat other animals. So there are several factors that are leading to the rise. One, of course, is human population. We've, we're, we're at a number that we've never been before, and that makes it easier for uh, viruses to mutate and spread among people. The other, of course, is that we're, we're traveling more than ever before, which is what we saw with COVID-19 and how it could easily spread around the globe. But some of the most significant factors that are contributing to our rise in infectious diseases is really about how we treat other animals. So if we look at COVID-19, a lot of the focus has been on the uh, live markets in China, where we believe that it originated. Um, or at least where it first transmitted into the human population. So, so much attention has been on live markets and everyone thinks that the cause of the virus is and causes of future virus will come from over there, you know, from China. But that's not really the case. Um, these live markets where many different types of animals are brought together and they are sold often for meat and other types of objects and they're often killed on premise in very horrible ways. Um, they're treated horribly in these live markets, but it is, the live market is just the tipping, the, the end point of a very, and a much larger and widespread wildlife trade. And I'm not talking about the illegal wildlife trade here. I'm talking about the wildlife trade that is very legal and, and sanctioned by our government. And it's big business throughout the world. The U.S. is one of the biggest importers and exporters of wildlife. So we are one of the major contributors to the wildlife trade. What happens in the wildlife trade is that you are, people go out, they are either breeding animals as um, to, to create a stock of animals or they're capturing them from the wild. And what you do in the wildlife trade is you often bring together different species 
species, animals which are sick, which are distressed because of the conditions that they're experiencing. And you bring these different species together, species which may not have normally interacted with each other. And so it makes it very easy for a virus to jump from one species onto another and then ultimately to humans. This is what we saw, or what we expect has occurred with COVID-19. Now, after the wildlife trade, the other big risk for infectious disease is coming from factory farms, industrialized farming. And that has, as we all know, that has increased in recent decades and it's now a global phenomenon. I think it started in the US, but now it's prevalent throughout the world. Most meat, the eggs and dairy are coming from factory farms. And like the wildlife trade, and the conditions in factory farms are absolutely terrible. Again, the animals are very sick. They're very distressed. They suffer a great deal. And that makes it again. And, and in addition, they're, also, they're enclosed in very tight spaces. They're so crowded into factory farms. And all of those factors make it very easy for a bird flu or a swine flu to pass from one animal to the other and mutate. And it's, um, you know, it's as bad as the pandemic is today, I fear that the next pandemic will come from a factory farm. And I fear that this is just um, um, like a, a small taste of what a pandemic could be, that this is not as bad as it can be. Yeah, and your your work explores um, specifically how how stress increases an animal's susceptibility to disease and and the likelihood for them to spread disease. And could you speak to the types of stressors that you think are putting us most at risk? Sure. So it, it's like with humans, you know, when when we're under stress, our immune systems actually go down. It it makes it harder to fight off infections. So when we're under stress, I'm sure many people have seen this, when you're overworked, when you haven't slept well, you're more likely to catch the flu virus, for example, or some or a cold. So it's the same with every other animal. When they're under stress, they're more likely to catch infectious disease. So the, the factors the, that increase their stress are the conditions in factory farms conditions that the animals experience throughout the wildlife trade. So these factors include overcrowding. It includes, um, in factory farms, it includes things like uh, manipulation of the animals. You, you're, you're cutting uh, chickens' beaks off, which is a very painful, very painful thing. They are bred to basically to ridiculous sizes and weights where their bones will crumble underneath their weight. And you can imagine how painful that is. Um, pigs suffer from uh, porcine syndrome, which is very much related to the stress factors that, or the factors that contribute to stress in factory farms. So the conditions are so bad, but then these animals are often so badly treated by the workers in these farms and during slaughter itself at the slaughterhouses. Animals we've seen, so many investigations have shown animals beaten, prodded, um, you know, just bludgeon and, you, you know, all of this. And when animals are seeing other animals go through this, that increases their stress as well and their distress. So the, all of these factors contribute to an increased risk for these animals to contract infections and pass it on to others and ultimately on to us. And you've talked about um, uh, workers interacting with these animals. What are what do you see as the most concerning um points where animals are interacting with people so with factory farms you know we see workers are interacting with animals often on a daily basis i mean even though these factory farms are mechanized as much as possible there's still a lot of day-to-day -day activity and interaction at least within the setting of a factory farm and with the workers and studies have shown that the workers in factory farms are much more likely to contract different kinds of infectious diseases, much more likely to experience um, respiratory problems because of the, the, the stench and the ammonia and the other airborne uh, things in the um, in factory farms. So what happens is that when you have a, a factory farm worker interacting with animals in these conditions, they can then bring an infection out to their family and then ultimately onto the larger community. 
And there are other types of spread as well, it's my understanding. So there's also concerns with um, sort of indirect contact with these animals. So not just farm workers and then them spreading, uh, potentially spreading pathogens, but also um, through manure and, and that getting into waterways or into cropland. Is that right? Right. So what, what I was, when I was talking about the spread um, from the conditions in the farms, I was mostly talking about viruses because the fear with viruses is that they can become airborne. And that's one of the things we see with many different strains of avian influenza, bird flus and swine flus is that they become airborne. And when a virus is airborne, it is very easy to contract and very easy to pass on to another. Now, on top of that, there are a lot of bacteria that these animals carry. So, and studies have shown that the stress factors in both the factory farms and in the transportation part to the slaughterhouses and then what happens at slaughterhouses actually increases the shedding of different types of bacteria. So animals in factory farms will carry bacteria like Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter and other things that we then can contract. We can contract either because it comes out in the manure of these animals, which is then spread over our crops. It can go into the waterways and factory farms and studies have shown that. Studies have shown bacteria in the soil down, uh, downstream and in the air downwind from these factory farms. And of course we can catch these bacteria when we eat these animal products. And you've spoken um, about animals on factory farms and a bit about live markets and the wildlife trade um, and, and perhaps unlike live markets where animals are, are more often captured from the wild and then relatively quickly sold, maybe in days or weeks or perhaps months. But there are also wild animals that are um, held captive for virtually their entire lives. I think about um, animals that are used in circuses and traveling shows or on, on fur farms. Could you speak to the, the disease risk from those animals? Yeah, so the these like fur farms have many of the same conditions that factory farms do. So we've seen how COVID-19 has spread rampant across mink farms in the United States and abroad. And we've seen new variants come out because of the spread in mink farms. The conditions there in mink farms are very similar to what is occurring in factory farms. Again, mink are just they're terrible conditions for these poor animals. They really are. And so, you know, it, it really shows how, when we cause suffering to animals, how that comes back to cause suffering for us. Um, and with other, other types of captive animals, you mentioned elephants. Often the risk is the reverse. Um, elephants in captivity often catch tuberculosis from humans, and that's been a significant risk for them. So. Zoonosis, and it's important for people to realize, is not just a one-way thing. It's not just we capture infectious diseases from other animals, but we can pass on infectious diseases to other animals as well. And with elephants, that's a case of this other type of zoonosis where we pass on tuberculosis to animals. Um, monkeys, non-human primates, are shipped around the globe. They may be bred or they are captured from the wild to create breeding stocks. In, and then they are then sold and shipped into the U U.S. and elsewhere. They are used a lot in um, experimentation, and monkeys can carry a lot of viruses that can play be a significant risk for us. As a matter of fact, the only time we saw Ebola in the United States was after shipments of monkeys into the United States to be used for experimentation. And um, so monkeys can carry a lot of infectious diseases. We know that, you know, um, simian immunodeficiency virus, which um, and we know that we got or we suspect that we got HIV from contact or eating non-human primates or other animals. So that that's a significant factor as well. You mentioned reverse zoonosis in the context of elephants and tuberculosis. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that's impacting uh, mink fur farms and the spread of COVID-19? I don't. So, it, it, you know, we don't know. It's a good question, right? Because the likely scenario is um, people who are working in mink farms introduce the virus to mink in the farms. And in that setting where these animals are caged, and densely caged and um, again they're just in miserable conditions 
the virus spread very rapidly among the mink and it mutated and we saw variants come out and then that caused further reinfection in the human population. So it, it, this is what we see in factory farms too. We can introduce a virus, a worker can introduce a virus to pigs or chickens, especially pigs, um, because pigs can carry influenza viruses from other chickens, from pigs and from humans. So workers just can carry, you know, some kind of influenza virus, you know, common flu, for example, or something like that, and introduce it into the population in a factory farm. And then it could spread rapid, and then it can mutate and then come back into the human population. You spoke about some of the wild animals that are held captive for virtually their entire lives, whether they're in circuses and traveling shows or on fur farms. Um, could you talk a little bit about, about animals used for research and testing? Right. So, you know, we, we did talk about monkeys being shipped into the United States for use in experimentation, and they are held captive. Obviously, they're, they're entire lives, which may be very short, depending on the type of experiments they undergo. One of the things um, that has really come about from this pandemic is that we need a biomedical system that's going to enable us to rapidly respond to new public health threats like this, like COVID-19. And so one thing that my organization, Center for Contemporary Sciences, is really trying to do is really work with um, governmental agencies and um, academic centers and, uh, and others to really push a sea change because we know that animal experimentation, including experimentation on monkeys, is not very effective. Actually, it's not very reliable in telling us whether a drug or vaccine is going to be safe in, in humans. So the pandemic, in a way, has led to an increase in the call for monkeys to be shipped into the US by some for future pandemics, but it has also led to an increased recognition by a lot of pharmaceutical agents that we need testing methods that are based on human biology. So that's really the future of medicine and that the more we move away from animal testing, not only will we have a much more accurate and reliable biomedical system that will benefit us, but we will also reduce our risk of other infectious diseases like the Ebola risk that occurred when monkeys were shipped into the U.S. in the past. So there's a, a lot of good reasons to really move away from animal testing. And are there human-animal interactions that you think are putting us most at risk? Is it in the factory farm setting, whether it's animals farmed for food or fur, or is it something else? It's, I, I honestly would say it's, it's both the wildlife trade and factory farming. So factory farming puts us at risk in the ways that I mentioned directly. It also puts us at risk because it causes ecological disruption. We know that most of the forests are grazed um, and um, bulldozed to make um, land for cattle to graze, right? And that causes ecological disruption and that puts humans closer in contact with many species out in the wild. And that makes it easier for infections or viruses that they may carry to, to you know, pass on to us. Also, factory farming is increasing climate change. And we, because of climate change, we are seeing a rise in mosquito-borne viruses. The uh, warming of the climate is very conducive for mosquitoes and for mosquito growth. So now we're seeing a rise in mosquito-borne viruses. And maybe that's what caused, um, contributed to the emergence of the Zika virus that we saw and that caused a, a great deal of panic not, not too long ago. Um, and then factory, and then um, the wildlife trade for the conditions that I mentioned, and also the wildlife trade also causes ecological disruption. So the wildlife trade also puts humans in close contact with wild animals, with species, which we normally do not have day-to-day -day interaction with. And again, that makes it easier for what we call spillover, for a, a virus to spill over into the human population. So what do you hope that people take away from our session today? Are, are there actions that they can take to reduce our risk from zoonotic disease? Yeah, one thing I would say, every single one of us can, can do something right now, and that's significantly. And I would say, if you can stop altogether, do that. 
significantly reduce our, you know, your consumption of meat, eggs, and dairy. That's one of the number one things you have to do. And also support any policies that help phase out factory farming, industrial farming, that lead to better conditions for animals in factory farming. Now, even policies that lead to better conditions for animals, they're a step in the right direction, but they're not the, they're not the total prevention. The total prevention will only come when we really do fundamentally change how we treat all animals. And that means not having factory farms. And I would argue for us not to eat animals at all because there are so many risks that come about from eating animals. So we can, at least in the meantime, you know, support policies that make conditions better for animals in factory farms that may help curtail the wildlife trade, at least to some degree. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, just let the media, when, when we see an article in the media, in the New York Times or any other magazine or newspaper that's talking about the pandemic, remind them why we got this pandemic. You know, you know, there's often the public commentary section where you can just quickly add a public commentary and people really do read those. I know I read them. I, I, I read them a lot. Let people remind people why we got this pandemic. I think people are very quick to forget this pandemic. And I fear that that's what's happening. Um, and our governmental agencies and the media have not done a their job really in showcasing why we are getting why we got this pandemic and why we're likely to get more to come. So we need to remind them, we need to remind our public health agencies, our governmental agencies and the media as much as we possibly can. About the connection between animals and, and pandemics. And uh, you were speaking about the need to, um, to phase out factory farming and, and curtail some of the most cruel practices. And I also think a lot about how we can help um, pursue policies to support farmers and communities in their transition to an alternative, more sustainable and more resilient food system away from the factory farming system that we currently have, um, as well as ensure equitable resource allocation, including to, as you mentioned, um, safe and, and plant-based foods. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Akhtar. In, in, in looking to the future, as we've talked about, I, I think we can agree we, we really must pursue policy solutions that are more humane, equitable, and sustainable, and that will create transformative change across industries and social conditions. Um, and, and we invite everyone at home to join us in our effort, and we hope that you'll check out more information about our legislative work toward these goals at aldf.org legislation. Thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, um, I, well, yes, I guess. Um, I hope <laughs> I hope people take um, inspiration from this conversation to really not let up on our governmental agencies. I mean, they, after this pandemic is over, they are going to just kind of get back to normal and we cannot afford to get back to normal. We need to constantly remind people that we cannot go back to normal. Normal was not good. Normal is what led to this pandemic. So we do need to really change, like you said, really have transformative changes in how we treat other animals. Thank you so much. Thank you.